You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 54. This podcast is dedicated to circus. Every week, I interview a professional in the circus industry, sharing stories of success and failure, viewpoints about art and the world, and information about and around this growing industry. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. Shout out, as always, to the people who keep me going, my wonderful Patreons. I love you guys so much. If you want to feel love, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Sign up today. My guest today is Lacey Alana. Lacey is a licensed clinical social worker and trauma therapist who blends expressive arts with therapeutic tenants to help those who have endured trauma or are neurodivergent. Those are a lot of big words, I know, and saddle up because this interview contains many more. But Lacey does an excellent job of explaining the big words and showing the connection between the brain and the rest of the body and how teaching circus can be healing. She gives tips that any circus instructor can use, even those who are teaching a general population. For more in-depth information about the topics we cover in this interview, I highly suggest you go check out her blog at yesandbrain.com. Here's my interview with Lacey Alana. Lacey Alana. Yeah. Welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you. Ching. We did Um, it. God, we did it. That took us so long. (laughs) <laughs> just shy of three minutes yeah right okay oh man this interview is going to be great now we're ready we're here mm-hmm. can you say who you are and yeah. what you do sure so I'm a licensed clinical social worker and also a registered social worker in Canada now and a lot of the work that I do in addition to kind of normal regular psychotherapy that people think of is blending the expressive arts with therapeutic tenets, which largely I do through circus arts and also through improv theater. The ex- wait, expressive arts through therapeutic tenets. Yes. Explain that to me like I'm five years old <laughs> okay. and I'm an actor. Um, <laughs> Andrew and I, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so using artistic expression like through circus and improv theater and understanding the kind of fundamental ideas of what makes something healing and what makes something therapeutic and bringing some of those elements into circus work and improv theater to create a fun and interesting, not exactly therapeutic intervention, but kind of framework to engage in therapeutic progress. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of people say like, oh, circus is my therapy. Circus is my, you know, and what they mean is it's like my hobby or my way to relieve stress or get out from the day to day. What does it mean in your world to have circus as therapy? Not your therapy, but others therapies. Yeah. I mean, I think I can't help but move through the world, I guess, and see and understand why the things that we do are what we do and why they feel good for us when we do them. So one of the things that we know about kind of the brain and body and as we are moving through the world is that we seek healing and often that there is a lot of wisdom in the things that our bodies are driven to do and the things that we find rewarding and satisfying. There's often a reason for that and generally Mm. it's because there's something about that that's like working for us that is serving a purpose. And so while, I mean, unless you're doing explicitly circus therapy, which then is therapy. But for a lot of people, I think, who aren't necessarily doing that, but are taking a class at their recreational studio or participating in a social circus class or whatever, still are getting a lot of therapeutic benefit from those experiences. And part of the reality that is reinforcing for them is indicative that there's something about that that their system needs. Uh, Okay. Um, Yeah. That's cool. I feel like I need therapy because of circus. (laughs) 
is. That's also that's a real thing. Issue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All together. Yeah. There's that too. Okay, but circus as therapy. So in the context that you take yeah. it into, what does that look like? What does that look like? To break that down a little bit more, I want to talk about the brain a little bit and like how Please. how this happens. And so if you think about even before we're born, we're developing in utero. And so things are happening that outside of our mother's body that affect like how our development's happening. A thing that people would think of most directly would be something like fetal alcohol syndrome. The mother consumes alcohol to an extent to which it compromises the fetal experience and how how their brain develops and how that unfolds. But there's things that are happening all the time in other ways. So you have someone who's repeatedly stressed a mother and like that the chemicals that are happening in her body are affecting mm. the baby in utero. Okay. So there's things that are happening in that setting already. And then when we're born, there are kind of what's often called the critical period, which is the first couple of years of life where there's a lot of brain development that is occurring. And a couple of things are super important about this is that because infants don't have access to cognitive language, you can't have a conversation with a baby in a way that's useful for them that they're going to be able to internalize, right? So you can't can, be like, yo, why are you crying, baby? Exactly. exactly. If the baby's crying, <laughs> What's you can't going be on? like, hey, just hold on for one minute. I'm making your bottle and it'll be fine if you could just take the volume down a couple You know, like it's not, it's not productive. And so some of the ways that we find and seek and understand the world as a safe or not safe place is through the other things that happen that are sort of the language, if you will, of infants and children, which are things like attachment with a caregiver, like having lots of repetitions of, you know, the parent holds the baby and the baby makes the coup and the parent goes, you know, responds to that. And there's sort of this dyadic exchange that happens over and over again. So you're building this context in which the child's deferring and looking to the parent. Some of it is in kind of sensory input that's happening. So you get, you know, you get the rocking, you get the input that's happening that is really regulating. And like, really, we are incredibly sensory based beings. So it's like the way that we experience the world is super sensory based. So if you look at the vagal nerve, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, because that's also a part of this, I guess to give a little bit of information about it, it is kind of the main conduit for the parasympathetic system that connects in with all of our different organs, goes up into our face, into our eyes, into our ears, all of these different pieces. And is it like one nerve? Like, can you find the vagal nerve in your pinky finger? I mean, I can't. <laughs> like, could one? But, like, is this I mean, like a... It's a massive... I'm trying a, to picture it. Like, it, it's, it's... If you think of your root nerves as, like, the root system. Yeah, it's, it looks okay. like a root. Like, if you, okay. if, you look, if you look at a just an image of, like, this is what a vagal nerve is, like, you're going to see, like, the central heavy cord, if you will, of uh-huh. it, and then all of the sort of branches out like a very robust root system. Okay. And so one of the things that's particularly interesting about it is uh-huh. that... of, if you imagine it like a highway, there's four lanes that are going from the senses that we're taking in and from the different places in our body to our brain giving information, and only one lane coming from our brain to our body, which is, right, which is why when we talk about, you'll hear particularly trauma therapists, which I consider myself, talk about kind of healing from the bottom up. And like, that's one of the things that it's referring to is that it's like, you can do lots of cognitive meaning making and also when we are in a place where we're dysregulated in our bodies like there's only so much that you can cognitively do and it's actually a lot more useful often to get in touch with like what's happening in the physical body and to shift and change like the regulation that's happening there which then instead of changing the thoughts exactly change the body exactly because inevitably it's like we are sensory beings moving through the world all of that information is going to our brain and then our brain makes meaning of that because we're also like meaning making storytellers basically yeah the challenge is is that our brain doesn't always perceive accurate information in our present day lives so for example do you want to just get into the polyvagal i mean i feel like we're getting into that but i'm like this is tangential but also it's not going back to circus i can bring it back to circus even now and then yes you must okay great well i mean like i'm already doing it in my head and that's it but i'm also like what what when we're little kids how does that connect back to circus and the poly, like yeah. is the vagal nerve more stimulated in those earlier years well so if you think about like 
the pieces of like language, quote unquote, that are happening for infants, it's the language of regulation. It's the language of like co-regulation with a parent. It's the language of rhythm. It's the language of play. It's the language of repetition okay. and playing, you know, the peekaboo over and over again. And the, through those experiences, like that is how your system sort of collects this information, processes it, comes to understand how they move through the world. So there's this thing called neuroception, which is basically the idea that our autonomic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that handles the automatic function. So things that you're not thinking about, like your, your digestion, your, your heartbeat, breath. exactly, okay, gotcha. your breathing, and also the emotional experiences of this. And so the autonomic... Oh, so your emotional nervous system <laughs> well, so is autonomic. Yes. So, well, there's interplay. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, but there's interplay. But we will get we'll back get, to we'll circuits. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get I, know, there. I promise. We got uh, this. We got this. But so with neuroception, basically what that refers to is that Stephen Poor just coined that term. And he's talking about the fact that like we have automatic ways that we respond as we move through the world that happen below our conscious level of thought. So for example, the thing people think of a lot that I use as an example is if you get startled, your body physiologically responds to being startled before your thoughts catch up. So you don't say, I should widen my pupils, my heart should beat faster, so I'm ready to run away in case this is a bad situation that I'm in. Your body does all of those things and then later once your brain collects all of that sensory information your meaning making mind is like oh you were startled okay. and assesses either i need to run or i need to not run okay so what happens is that sometimes as people move through the world the their systems pattern based on the experiences that we've had so everybody does that so if you have a kid who's had a lot of abusive experiences for example like their system is ready to fire in a way that reinforces and that is consistent with what they've experienced, which is the world is an unsafe, dangerous place. So then you're in a situation where maybe things aren't actually that dangerous, but because their brain is naturally ready to be like, I'm on defense, the world is an unsafe, dangerous place, then... You're that... always slightly in a state of alert. Exactly. And so what Circus does, I did it. I'm coming back. <laughs> Nailed I'm it. I'm coming back. Is a lot of different things. But when we're looking at kind of that lower brain regulation, like looking at these regulatory pieces, it does a lot of different things. So one of the things, particularly if you think about kids or if you think about duo work, and even if you think about individual work that you have with a coach, there's that constant dyadic exchange equivalency happening that would happen between a mother and a baby of that just like, oh, you did the thing, like, oh, you're so great. You know, and the baby's, the baby's cooing, the mother's cooing, mm -hmm. there's the moment of like, mm -hmm. we're sure. connected, we're smiling, whatever. And what happens is that when we're adults or when you're a kid who's in foster care, who's had lots of really bad experiences, you're not excited to do that with someone like that's vulnerable and doesn't feel like a good thing. And as adults, we don't do that with each other in that exact way because we're adults. So we're not going to coo and babble at each other. I but see. we need basically the adult equivalency of that, which can happen through these moments of play through the moments of, you know, like, look, I did the thing. Oh, you did the thing. That's so great. You know, I'm turning to you to see that you're watching me do this thing. And like, there's these oh, moments interesting. of okay. connection and like replication of that dynamic that's happening. Is Does that, that why? Yes. And I'm going to make a jump and sure. you're going to have an answer. Is that why sometimes people who have had or have been ignored or abused or neglected as children and seek roles like in the performing arts or places where they have attention paid to them from an audience or something because they're getting that feedback? I definitely see how there could be a connection. Like I okay. don't I don't necessarily have data on that. So like I don't know that I can give like a yeah, scientific I guess it... answer to that. But but I do have thoughts. <laughs> like I do think that you know, with both kind of the improv theater work and with the circus work, and just I think work in general with like mainstream adult students and youth students that I've had, I think there is really something when you look at like self esteem, for example, and like where that comes from, that comes from mastery. Like it comes from, I did the mm -hmm. thing, I feel good about doing the thing. And that reinforces the pattern of like, I'm a worthwhile person who can do the thing. And when I put effort into it, the thing happened. And like, isn't that great that like this effort yielded this result? And like, that mattered. And so for a lot of people, that isn't the experience that they have growing up for whatever reason. Like maybe sure. their effort didn't yield that or they were in a situation where that was blocked. And one of the things that I think circus is particularly good at when it's taught well is providing kind of a progressive structure for you to develop that sense of mastery and develop that self-esteem of, you know, you start the bar 
low where it's like, yes, you can do this thing and you do the yeah. thing and it feels really scary. And so you, you feel... can literally start the bar low. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, uh, that. I yeah. saw what you did there. <laughs> Great job. Well, that... um, there's actually a lot of really interesting, just relevant pieces of like circus in terms of like conceptualizing psychological concepts in terms of, yeah, I was talking to my friend Robin, who's also an aerialist and a therapist and talking about like the window of tolerance and like the idea of like climbing the silks and the idea of like, when you're low to the ground, you feel like, all right, I'm fine when you're a new student. And then as you get higher, you start sometimes having, especially when you're starting out, like the fear, the panic of the like, oh my gosh, I'm so high. Sometimes you'll get the freeze that happens of like, oh my gosh, how do I get down? Even if you're physically capable of climbing all the way up. Sometimes it's just like, nope, this is this is it. Like I'm done. I need to I need to be done with yeah, this. Sure. And so it's kind of this like direct visual representation of this like the way that we experience kind of the ebbs and flows of psychologically oh, things escalating. You know, so it's sure. like you go up and that feels really intense. And then as you bring yourself back to the ground and you re-regulate, you're getting this opportunity to repattern your okay. neural experience, which is exactly kind of what it is about circus that i mean one of the things that i think works really well is that we're constantly kind of leaning into that space between where we're really comfortable and where we're not at all comfortable and like sort of looking for this like sweet spot to discover and it's like as we move ourselves into a place of competency our ability to go further expands. So it's like we get comfortable and we're like, oh, I mastered this thing, or maybe I didn't master this thing, but I'm no longer a 10 out of 10 terrified of it. And now I'm a seven out of 10, and next week I'm a five out of 10. And then so the week after that, I'm ready to feel more confident about myself. Cool. In this setting, and that generalizes. So back to the Vegas. I know. Nerve. Sorry, uh, there's so much no, information no, no, no. to disseminate. Please don't apologize. <laughs> this is great. That's why I put a microphone on yep. your hoodie and turned it on because yeah. I wanted you to talk. <laughs> Do not apologize. Please keep talking. But the vagal nerve. Yeah. Different. Yeah. So well. So you want me to talk about it? Yeah, I want you to talk about okay. it. Okay. Because you wrote this great blog post yeah. that like went crazy viral yeah. and everybody's going nuts over it. Yeah. I read it a while ago and mm-hmm. was going to reread it before this interview mm-hmm. and then had no time. And here time. we are. Yep. So <laughs> totally tell fine. me about it. Tell you about it. Yeah. Yeah. So neuroception, which we already talked about, yes. the kind of like the fact that there's stuff that's happening in our bodies without us manually triggering it with our cognition and telling it to happen. The second piece of this is so generally people have, because this was what people were taught until this theory was developed, the sense of the autonomic nervous system in two parts, in the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. And the previous understanding of that was the sympathetic system mobilizes you for the fight or flight so that if you need to run, you can run and get away from the bad thing or, you know, do the thing that you need to do to save your life. And then the parasympathetic system was understood to be basically the counteracting element against that that brought you back into home. It like chills you out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you have the the thing that happened where you needed to mobilize and then the parasympathetic system is like, cool, I got you. I'm going to bring you back okay. down. Which I always thought was really confused and they should have been switched because like I always think of sympathy as like this like, the mellowing it's okay, thing. chill out. Yeah. So anyway, that always we can, confused We can me. write a letter to somebody and see I'm if going we can to, sort it out. Sure. Right, you should. But that's not um, the thinking anymore is what you're well, saying. Well, so it's just... It's expanded. So there is okay. still parasympathetic system and the sympathetic system. And those are, I'm going to talk about it in terms of states within the polyvagal theory, but also keep in mind that like these systems both do activate in different ways. So if we look at kind of that idea of like the window of tolerance and we're looking at like what accelerates me, the sympathetic mm-hmm. system, and what puts the brakes on the parasympathetic system, even something like taking a deep breath in activates your sympathetic system. If I get up and walk across my house, my sympathetic system Mm, is mm -hmm. in motion. And when I breathe out, my parasympathetic system's in motion. So it's like, those are in play all the time. Okay. But with polyvagal theory, what Stephen Porges presented in the 90s is that basically the parasympathetic system has a dual function, both that it does sort of 
somewhat what was previously understood that it could bring us kind of down. But then also the piece that is new about this is the idea of the social engagement system. And so this is basically an understanding that the parasympathetic system is the the thing that enables us to be in a place where we're ready to connect with other people. So Deb Dana, who's a therapist who wrote a book about polyvagal theory in therapy specifically and how to utilize and implement that, talks a lot about this in terms of a ladder analogy. And so if you're at the top of the ladder, that's you're in the social engagement system. And this is the place where we're ready to talk and connect and where you're able to use our facial expressions to communicate things and we're engaged with each other. We're using vocal prosody to like communicate. So we're at the ideas. top of the ladder right now. We're at the top of the ladder right now. We hey. did it. We're doing great. The um, view's amazing. Yeah, we're at the top of the ladder. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, we're at the top of the ladder. Okay. And when you're in the top of the ladder, you are going to view and understand the world that you're moving through within the context of that ladder, of where you are. Right. So for example, it's like you're looking through the top of the ladder lenses. So if something happens that's like mildly stressful, you're going to handle that in stride. Like things are pretty fine. Like I've got this, it's no big deal. If you continue to experience stressful things or something that's more stressful, then you essentially slide down the ladder into this sympathetic place. Mm, So this is the place of activation, fight or flight. And just like when you're at the top of the ladder and you're perceiving and understanding the world through that perspective, when you're in the sympathetic system, it's the same thing. So this is the place where you're more likely to be defensive or feel judged or feel attacked and respond accordingly because you're in an activated place where you're like scanning and aware of the environment. And And people who have undergone trauma are generally living at the bottom of the ladder? Well, so there's one more rung. Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah, so there's one more place. Okay. So if you're in the sympathetic system and you continue to experience significant hardship, then you slide down into the dorsal vagal. So this is, there's the ventral vagal, which is the social engagement system. I don't think I put that label on it when we talked about it. And then the dorsal vagal. So biologically, one of the things that's important to know is that we developed this access to these different parts of our brains throughout time. So if you look back to like ancient, ancient amoeba creature times, they lived in dorsal vagal all the time. Like they had no other access to any other things. As time passed on, sympathetic system came online. As more time passed on, now mammals have, and only mammals, have access, they assume, to the social engagement system. So you think about like a dog okay. and like dogs have a social engagement system, which Do is like, delightful to think about, you so know, good. like, and then, and then they have the sympathetic system where you have a dog that like panics and you're going to hear a specific kind of growl or bark or like acknowledgement from them that is going to make everybody in the room look and turn and be like, what was that? Yeah, sure. What was that noise? Yeah. So back to the bottom of the ladder. So if you're in the dorsal vagal state, that's basically biologically is designed to be the place that's like, I'm in really bad shape. I'm probably going to die. Let's make this as painless as possible. Something that's important to know also is that all of this is designed with survival in mind. Like all of these functions exist and operate and neuroception operates with the goal of surviving. Like that is how these things operate and why Uh they operate. And I think the second piece that I consider really important is the idea that we're all adaptive. So it's like we have this like genetic wiring, this structure, like we all have this system within us. And then as we move through the world and experience whatever we're going to experience, we adapt. And so we adapt to whatever our situation is. Our brain learns how it should fire. And really, that's quite practical because if you think about like the idea of an animal in the wild. So you think about like a bear who's like trying to figure out how to get a productive meal to happen. If it's trying something repeatedly and that's not working, then it's going to try something else because the brain is like, yeah, this is not a good use of our time and our resources and our energy. Sure. So like, that's like a very concrete way to be like, oh, okay, this is something that happens. Yeah. So this we're at the ladder. You asked me. <laughs> I know. I don't so people who have oh, yeah, encountered asked... trauma yeah. are in the bottom rung the dorsal vagal so aspect not necessarily okay often people who have experienced trauma 
live in one of the bottom two often. Mm, okay. Uh, one of the things that can happen, a lot of people will talk about trauma as a state shifting disorder. So in terms of like, as imagining these three as states, that it's instead of having sort of the mobility that someone who hasn't experienced trauma might have to move through these states, that they might end up kind of locked for extra long in either the dorsal vagal, the disassociated, the frozen, the I'm just like nothing I'm doing matters okay. kind of state or in that sympathetic place. And that's where you think about like the hypervigilance and like being super on edge. Okay. That's um, like the Vietnam War vet. Totally. Who's, like kid goes and taps him on the shoulder. And Absolutely. Like, exactly. Pushes him to the ground. Exactly. Yeah. Also, this is like a very simplified abbreviated version of this so you can be in mixed states there's a lot of movement that happens between it you know there's a lot of nuance to this and mixed states aren't always bad so for example play is often considered a mixed state with being in social engagement and sympathetic so it's like moving between so i would say circus fits into that a lot as well which is actually really biologically important because our brains need to have those patterns of it's like the game of peekaboo as a baby like you have the moment where like there's the moment of like oh no what's happening and then they come Uh, back and you're like oh you're still there mom i'm so glad you didn't vanish on me and so it's kind of that same idea of like we want to be like pushing into a place where it's like i can i can engage i can feel that activation and also then re-regulate and also being in that sympathetic state isn't always like a fight or flight bad place like that could be the like i'm taking a lap around the studio right and that's what's happening right now but if you get stuck in that place then that's an exhausting place to be stuck okay and so your work with people who have undergone trauma and circus is helping them move through those states by using circus activities Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. Did I do it? Yeah, you did. You did it. Good job, Because this is what happens oh. on this podcast. Is I try to simplify things for people or like yeah. so that I can yeah, understand yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. And then whoever's talking, who's an expert and has a lot of information, is like, yes <laughs> and, and no. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Um, but would that be an accurate assessment? Like that's yeah, I, the I think idea? That that's a, yeah, I think that that's the idea. I, I think, think there's I understand more, it. Okay, yeah, cool. Like I think that there's more to it than that. But yes. And and I think too, I'll say that I really, you know, people ask like, what are the things that I should do with, because the work that I do is largely, I don't think I said this at the beginning, like the kind of two domains that I consider myself an expert within are trauma and neurodivergence. And so okay. a lot of- How do you define neurodivergence? Yeah, sure. So that term came to be in like late mid late 90s by an autistic sociologist i believe who's in australia who is writing and it's a portmanteau of neurology and diversity so combining slamming those words together and basically the sort of it was really embraced by the autistic community and okay the idea around it is moving away from a pathological model so within the medical system there is a lot of sort of the your normal category and the you're not normal category Mm. so the pathologized category is the you're not normal category and so neurodivergence sort of moves away from that pathology model to the idea of if you take a subsection of however many people it only reasonably makes sense that there's going to be neurological diversity within that subsection of people and so it moves away from the idea of we need to fix and do away with these bad qualities that you have and into a place of, of course, there's diversity. And, and it's the same. We want the same for you, person who has autism, as we want for anyone else, which is that you get to harness the strengths that you have and work on the weaknesses that you right. have, because yes. that's a thing that every human should have access to. Right. Autism is not like a mental health issue, in other words. Yeah, it's looking at like, like I think it's a really unique set of strengths in a lot of different yeah. ways. And that doesn't mean that there aren't parts of that that might be challenging. And I think everyone has their challenging pieces. And and I do think that it's, I mean, it's like, it's a whole complicated thing because people, you know, because people, there's a, there's a lot of layers in that because some people will say, you know, well, that dismisses the acknowledgement, like it doesn't acknowledge the challenge that can exist for people who are moving through the world Mm, with some of the like diagnostic criteria. Okay. But it's like, if we unpack diagnosing, it's like that suggests pathology in and of itself. Well, I mean, realistically the way that people use 
diagnostics, when I think about it a lot, isn't even the most useful way. Like ultimately, the ability to diagnose people was invented so that clinicians had a shorthand that I could come to you and pass you a patient and say, hey, this patient has XYZ diagnosis. And you would go, aha, I have a basic understanding of what some of the things this patient might be dealing with are because you and I share a manual that lists what some of those things are. Right. Right. And so it's yeah. like that is the fundamental reason that that exists. And I feel like it's often it gets extended outside of that in a lot of ways that I think are problematic and everyone should identify with whatever they want to identify for themselves. You know, so it's like if someone okay. identifies with like whatever diagnostics, then great. Like I think that there can be a lot of power in identity and power in understanding like, oh, this is this is why I've been struggling. Like this is this is a real thing. You know, like this isn't I'm not crazy. I'm not whatever. I have bipolar disorder. Or I have I have major depression. Or I have an anxiety right. disorder. Yeah, 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 and it's yeah. like, oh, this is a thing. Like this isn't, you know. So I think that there's a lot of validity and good things that can come from it, and that there's some problems with it. So sure. So yeah. Neurodiversity. So neurodiversity. Great. Thanks for yeah. diverting. So, Thanks yeah. for so, uh, defining that. Yeah. So neurodiversity. Don't so remember you work what your with question was before. People who are neurodiverse yeah. and trauma. And those are your two yeah. specialties. Yeah. So those are my two specialties, which largely has played out both in kind of circus world and improv. So I run a training program in Indiana for helping professionals on integrating kind of improv pedagogy and exercises into work for kind of supporting social emotional learning for neurodivergent youth. Started a program in Austin that worked with foster youth, autistic youth, youth coming out of incarceration and integrating back into the community, youth at an LGBTQ plus drop-in center, homeless youth, wow. um, et cetera. Yeah. And then I ran a youth circus program in Austin as well that served both mainstream youth and also not mainstream youth in a couple of different ways. How are those programs different? Which ones? You said you had a program oh, the that first served one was the... so like a circus program that served mainstream youth and oh, not mainstream youth. Got it. So how What's did the difference you... between those programs? Yeah. How um, did you approach the two populations? Well, to some extent, that's an interesting question. Two Thank full... you. Yeah. Great job, Shannon. It's like you should <laughs> run a podcast or something. I should. <laughs> yeah, so twofold. One, there were some classes for certain groups or populations. And okay. that's, you know, like, for example, before I started doing that, I was working as a therapist in a residential treatment center for kids that were in foster care. Okay. And so when I moved into the circus job, my kids from that job oh. came for regular lessons, which was great because then I still got to see all of these kids that I like cool. loved, but got to do circus with them, which they also thought was like wildly yeah, cool because I was their that. like therapist and then suddenly was their circus coach. So it's like there were some that were really different. And a lot of the program was actually really integrated because one of the things that happens is that when people who have kids that don't always get accepted into regular programs or don't succeed in regular programs find out that you can accommodate them, they all show up real fast. Mm. So it's like in summer camps, the mainstream summer camps, I had lots of kids who had autism diagnoses, lots of kids who had trauma histories, lots of kids who had these these different pieces that where they wouldn't necessarily find success in whatever setting that they'd been to, you know, I get a lot of parents saying, you know, well, we've, we've tried this, we've tried that, it hasn't worked out. So and what do you do or what yeah, strategies do you approach well, that? So this is, this is the thing that's interesting is that people will ask, like, you know, what are the right things that I teach? Like, what are the things that I should do? What's going to work right. with this group? Yeah. And the, the reality for me is that the entire way that I approach teaching is that sort of the underpinning philosophy and theory behind it actually is the same regardless of who I'm working with. So I'm considering the pieces of regulation and all of the pieces that we've talked about in terms of like, where is this human and what do they need mm. from me right now? I'm looking with the idea of instructional scaffolding, which enables you to adapt anything for anybody, which I can break that down if we need yeah, to break that what, what, okay, what do you mean what, instructional what does that mean? scaffolding? Uh, yeah, so scaffolding is basically the idea of identifying what a learner can do independently on their own without any assistance and identifying what the learner can do with support from you and helping provide sort of a systemic 
structure for them to increase their competency. So, oh, dope. I do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you do. No, no, no. It's super, yeah. It's super common in circus. I didn't know that it was called that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super common in circus. And so the... for people scaffolding. For people who don't know what we're talking about yet. Yeah, I was going to make the, the joke that like... I yeah. just see if they can do a pull-up or not. And if they can do a pull-up, yeah. we do this thing. And if yeah. they can't do a pull-up, we do this, work yeah, on pull-ups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, gotcha. for people okay, that are cool. not following along, kind of reference point that most people are familiar with in this area is the idea of if you're trying to help a baby learn how to walk, if you take that baby and you stand them up and put their feet on the ground and you remove your hands, the baby's going to plop onto the ground. Right. If you do that enough times, the baby might even start having feelings about you putting them in that position because they're like, what are we doing? This is not a good time for me. So instead, what we do when we tend to naturally do this. You know, you hold the baby there, you give them progressively more weight, you hold, your grip goes a little bit lighter, you guide them to the coffee table to hold on to, you move the coffee table, they stand in the middle of the room, right? So you've provided this scaffolding for yeah. them to help them achieve this mastery that they wouldn't have achieved. I mean, they would have eventually probably figured out standing, but that they wouldn't have necessarily learned on their own. And then when it's time to take it to the next level, you re applies support. So the kid's learning to walk now, and maybe all of a sudden, again, you're holding onto their hands, you're providing them an extra layer of support. So it's essentially a way to move people through the learning process that in a way that's accessible and that helps set them up for success, and also that psychologically supports them along the way. Because like I'd mentioned with the bear situation earlier, if you have a situation where a learner is repeatedly running into an experience where they're failing, so you're being set up to fail and to not find success, we land in what's called the fixed mindset, which is the opposite of the growth mindset, which people are generally really familiar with. And it's it's adaptive, like it's biologically adaptive that you will stop expending your effort towards something when it is no longer working or serving you. Mm -hmm. And so that makes sense biologically because that's what should happen. And it means that as educators, we have a lot of responsibility because not only are we teaching people the skill or not, but we're impacting the way that they approach learning and approach moving towards things that feel difficult to them or not moving towards them. That's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So that's why we have to scaffold. So right. ultimately for me, I'm always looking at what is that, that sort of middle zone is called the zone of proximal development, which is like that zone of that window of like in between what you can do by yourself and what you can't do by yourself. And so you're looking to progressively zone move. zone of yeah. proximal, proximal development. development. <laughs> yep. There yep. will be a test at the end of this podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you're always looking for that window. So that's one of the things that I'm always doing when I'm working with anybody that I'm working with. Okay. And for me personally, I have several sort of branches of circus scaffolding that I've just like created to conceptualize and communicate with other people when yeah. people are like, how do I put this on its feet that consider like, how do you proactively like consider emotional regulation and like scaffold that skill? How do you reactively do that if someone's having a hard time in a class? How do you, okay. how do you teach a skill if you want to teach the skill? Which I think that's the way that most circus instructors will probably identify with immediately is that idea of like, oh yeah, I, my hand spots suddenly become less hand spotty as the student gets more skilled or if you ever pull lines right you suddenly you know you work the student to where they're out of lines eventually yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's what happens but I don't think I ever approach it the first thing you mentioned before you mentioned instructional scaffolding mm -hmm. was um you check in about like emotional regulation yeah I mean, I ask people how their bodies are feeling, mm -hmm. and I will kind of notice if someone's visibly upset coming into a mm -hmm. lesson. I know that they're probably going to be useless for the lesson. But for you and for in your work, like, what does that mean? What does that what look, do those like? Assessments look like? Yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes that could be explicit conversations and asking or talking about, like, yeah, just like how are things going, and like making space to actually have that moment of. How, how are you? You know, and not just the like, oh, how's it going? Like, we're quickly being like, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, work stressful. Gotta go. You know, like, but yeah. having the moment of like, I'm connecting with you. I'm making eyeball contact with you. I'm asking for real. How are you? What's happening in your world? But I would say more often than not, one of the things that's happening with kind of that neuroception and as we're assessing ourselves and our own sort of safety is that we have systems in our body that pick up a lot on the cues that other people are sending. And sometimes we pick up on those really well, and other times we don't. But I do think that for me, part of that process is 
really sort of looking and sort of getting that feel for like, where is this person and what's happening? And like, what do I notice about them? And it's like, Mm. once you start knowing someone, the way that when we're in different stages of the ladder, for example, like, you know, if you've ever had a moment where it's like, you've been upset, maybe in a hard conversation with someone and you feel like you can't look them in the eyes, you know, like you just like your gaze is down towards the ground and it's like hard to re engage and it's like that's like a big example of it but it's like the way that we are experiencing emotion manifests itself in our human body and in the way that we move through the world and in the way that we engage with each other and so i mean i'm a therapist so i have training in some of these pieces right and i think that these are pieces that i've intentionally cultivated for myself as well of kind of assessing and understanding where is someone and like what's happening with them and like feeling out like where are they within this window and like having that sort of check-in and dialogue that might not be verbal but sort of that just like the rhythm that you find with them in that co-regulation of like where are we sure Um, yeah yeah totally and i do feel like that co-regulation is something that falls into like therapy skill domain i mean i think it's something that everyone can do but i do think that that's like something that the foundation was laid for me in a therapy context. And I think for me, like, I think what feels most important to me is the priority of connecting with another human. And like, circus is a vehicle to do that and a vehicle that does provide us a lot of natural gifts because of kind of the rhythm and some of the movements that we're doing and how that relates to some of that kind of lower brain soothing and those kinds of pieces. So there are these concrete places But I feel like there's something that is really unique about getting to join with someone in this potentially like really vulnerable space where they are working on pushing outside of that window and like being willing to like be vulnerable and let you guide them in that process. And so it's like, I don't know, like I consider it, it feels very sacred to me, like when I teach in that way, like because it feels really like intimate's not the right word exactly, but like it feels really connected. Like there's something that is there, like someone is letting you co-regulate with them and like right. share that yeah. connection. And like, I don't know, like it feels- Someone who probably that would not be their like go-to impulse. Yeah, yeah. And when it's, and especially when it is that case, mm-hmm. when it is that situation where you're building that relationship or that connection with that kid who maybe hasn't, found that success and like found those places of connection as they've moved through the world and it's like that's so powerful like that is where healing can occur like in those co-regulated places and like yeah I think that that is part of what is so important about it if someone wanted to do what you do if someone wanted to be a trauma specialist and neurodivergent specialist using circus arts to help people with those can I say conditions? Sure. Is situations. What would you recommend they do? Yeah. How um, would you go about that training? I mean, you need to learn circus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you it might need help to know, a little bit. You, you need to know how to teach circus. So like, you and when to... you say teach circus, this can be anything, right? This can be juggling. This sure. can be yeah, yeah, aerial yeah. arts. This yeah, can be absolutely. Contortion, acrobatics. Absolutely. Yeah. Find the thing. I think that we all bring unique things to the world and like find the thing that is your thing Mm -hmm. and I feel like one of the things that I mean I still need to continue taking this advice myself but that I realized looking back on this is that there's no way that I could have planned where I am right now like I never Mm. could have and like anticipated or wanted this like it was it was all about surviving for a long time Mm. and like now yeah it's like this has happened and so I think the biggest piece of advice I would have is to just lean ferociously into whatever is interesting to you and whatever you feel passionate about and whatever feels important to you and look for the why that drives what you do. Because ultimately identifying what it is that is the exact outcome isn't as initially important, I think. And sometimes we get hung up on that. Like what what is the what of like what this looks like when I'm quote unquote doing the thing right or I've landed in a place. And I think it's more important to figure out like why are you driven to this? Like why why do you want to do this? Why is this important to you? And then find the pieces that like resonate and just like lean in. So it's like find the circus apparatus that you 
love, find the discipline that you love. If you want to do actual therapy, you're going to need to also get a, at least a master's degree in therapy. Probably get a degree. Um, uh, go to school for a while. Yeah, and, go to school for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, in other yeah. words, you couldn't be, like, I could not just do this tomorrow. You can't do therapy, but no, I, but I would say not. that, he, but here's the thing is that I feel like part of what I'm so passionate about now is working with other people who are already doing this, because I would argue that you're already doing this. You just don't frame it like I frame it. Mm. And so to me, part of like what I want to continue doing is helping people to understand what it is that they're already doing and why it's important and then continuing to capitalize and harness their own sort of natural strengths and abilities to hold this space because no you're not going to do a therapy session with someone because that's not what's going to happen and no you're right. not going to have extensive experience of therapy no, and years of absolutely. doing you know but you're already doing a lot of this huh so that's cool the, that's the piece Sweet. yeah what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career I think to just lean into what feels good. Yeah. Like, I think that's it. Like, lean into what feels good. I think a lot also about kind of the idea of people talk about, like, oh, it's who you know, you know, Uh, as the thing. And I don't think it's totally right that what is right is that it's who knows you. And so that is the piece that ultimately matters in a lot of ways, which doesn't mean... I have never thought of it that way. Yeah. It's not about who you know, but who Who knows knows you. you. And so, and that's not, but take it to the second piece of this, which doesn't mean, I think that kind of can sound like, I don't know, weird, but to me that what that means is build relationships, like Mm -hmm. get to know people that you think do something cool, get to know what people need and what's important to them, figure out what your unique thing is that you can offer them and offer it, like be useful, be of service, like look for places where when you're starting your career in whatever thing that that is where you can afford to give more of yourself for the sake of learning or acquiring some piece of information and that ultimately matters like those are the pieces where it's like people who i didn't understand were going to be really important became really important because we just built a relationship they see Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. We'll definitely link to your blog. Sure. If you have any books or anything else that you think would be good resources for the audience. Oh, it's so long the list. I know. <laughs> As I'm saying uh-huh. it, I'm like, maybe I'm I mean, I've got a lot. Well, top five or something. Okay. You well, can... if you look at like the list of, at the, the list of, at the end of the Polyvagal blog, okay. there's probably 20 books listed there right Perfect. now. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> That was my interview with Lacey Alana. As I said right before I started playing the interview, I really suggest that you guys go and check out her blog, yesandbrain.com. She has amazing blog posts like The Science of Learning and Instructional Scaffolding in Circus Arts, the tools you're probably using that you need to understand, and Circus as a Healing Art, what polyvagal theory teaches us about why circus works. It's such cool information, and she goes way more in depth than she possibly could in the 40 minutes that I put her on record. So definitely to get the full experience and all of what Lacey has to say, go there, check it out. What really resonated with me, a couple of things really resonated with me, both personally and professionally, about our conversation. On a personal note, it was really cool to hear her talk about neurodivergence and people who are on the autism spectrum. As I've mentioned before on this podcast, my little brother has Asperger's syndrome, and he's an amazing human and is not a circus professional by any stretch of the imagination. But I always love hearing about how people in the circus industry are dealing with people who are neurodivergent or who are physically divergent or different than what we usually conceive of as the able-bodied people we see on stage. And professionally, what was so cool for Lacey to put into words for me was this idea that even if people are doing circus as a hobby... It can be a therapeutic experience. And this is something that I said at the beginning of the interview, people always joke, they're like, circus is my therapy. And as a professional who sometimes undergoes a lot of stress 
being a circus artist. It's hard for me to understand that. But Lacey really broke it down. And one of the things she said that I think is really true and that I've observed, well, is true. She's an expert. She knows these things. But it's this concept of developing self-esteem through a sense of mastery. And that is that idea that as we get better at something, our ability to master it kind of shows us what we're capable of and gives us a feeling of self-worth in the world. I think sometimes as circus artists, even as recreational artists, people can really just push to the next trick, push to the next trick, and never think about how much they've accomplished or mastered. And the practice of doing that can be really, really great for you, not only in the chosen hobby or art form of circus, but for your self-esteem as well. So taking moments to reflect. To find Lacey Alana online, one more again, her website is www.yesandbrain.com. She is also on Instagram. Yes and Brain is her handle. As for me, for aerial training tips and information and this super cool challenge slash crazy giveaway that I'm doing right now, you can go check me out on Instagram. I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. My website is theartistathlete.com. And this podcast comes out every week. So if you like what you're listening to, hit the subscribe button. It also really helps boost the podcast if you leave a rating and review. And if you love my voice so much, or let's be real here, the voices of all the awesome people I interview, you can go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Every dollar goes towards paying my editors, towards my sound equipment, and towards everything else that makes this podcast so much of what it is. Sending love to all my friends, fans, and enemies out there. Talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Aloha. My name is Beth Russell, and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee, and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and lira performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So, if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space, and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the cities, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. And goodbye.